In real open source, you have the right to control your own destiny. Linus Torvalds. Welcome to EOS Weekly. How is the physical world connected to the blockchain world? What is the bridge and where is the boundary? Through what mechanism can we humans located here in the physical world influence the state and the behavior of our blockchain? There is one simple answer to this question, and it is this. Asymmetric cryptography. In other words, the connection between private keys and public keys. That's it. The one and only one magical portal through which we humans can reach inside and interact with our blockchain is through this private-public key pairing. From the smallest transfer of tokens to smart contract updates, and even to changes in the system contracts themselves, the contracts which determine the core behavior of our blockchain, the mechanism through which we humans are able to reach inside and interact with our blockchain is always that same private-public key pairing. Private keys reside outside the chain. Public keys are placed like anchors at strategic positions inside the chain. And these two keys together become our one and only way of bridging the physical world with the blockchain world. But a single private-public key pair alone is not the strongest of bridges. It's more like a thin thread. It's vulnerable. Especially on the private key side where keys can be lost or stolen. Many of our fellow EOS community members have fallen victim to spoofing scams or have lost their keys accidentally. This is an awful thing when people lose access to their funds, and we can't emphasize enough how sad it is when this type of thing happens. But the asymmetric cryptography itself isn't the problem. This cryptography is incredibly powerful. The weak point lies in the management and usage of these keys. And there are two approaches we can take to minimize the risk involved in this area. On the one side, the off-chain side, we can build out tools, hardware wallets for safeguarding private keys, and we can create better indicators to let us know how risky it is to deal with a given application or smart contract. But the other thing we can do starts with the on-chain side of the divide up here and can be thought of as multiplying these thin threads out into a stronger, more robust bridge across. A bridge strong enough that a single lost or stolen key won't result in lost funds, where it'll be no big deal when this type of thing happens. This is where EOSIO permissions come into play, and this is the focus of today's episode. EOSIO permissions enable us to spread out the authority on a given account so that the on-chain side of the divide has a wide set of public key endpoints. All of these endpoints, all of these public keys along the edge here, enable us to achieve that stronger connection that we're talking about. What we can do here with EOS style permissions is we can structure our accounts in a way so as to require more or fewer people to approve account activity depending on the risk profile of a given account. Typically, we'll set up the higher value accounts so as to require a wider combination of human approvals, whereas the smaller and smaller value accounts will require fewer and fewer people to make approvals. When we structure our accounts in this way, storing value on the chain can be likened to burying treasures, with our most valued treasures buried deep within the network, requiring coordinated efforts to unearth them, while smaller accounts will be buried closer and closer to the surface. The single thread accounts right along the dividing line here will be more like spending cash in our pockets. These smaller accounts will have greater liquidity with an acceptable amount of risk for the amount of funds stored in them. Today, the account authority structure in the EOS network looks more like this. It's very flat, simple, it's an unmeshed network for the most part. And this type of structure is weak and vulnerable as we've seen by the successful number of attacks. But the future account authority structure is going to look more like this. And this version is strong and much less prone to attacks. The good news is that the layered hierarchy of accounts that you see here is already possible today, made possible through EOSIO permissions logic. And some of our block producers and other high profile accounts have already begun to structure things in this manner. In the remainder of this episode, we're going to show you how they're doing this. So that hopefully by the end of this video, you'll understand EOSIO permissions at a conceptual level and you'll have a better understanding as to the direction that the EOS network is headed. 
two real-world examples of layered hierarchies that are already following this future pattern are Chintai and EOSDAC. Chintai is simpler, so we'll start with this one. EOSDAC is a bit more complex, so we'll look at this one second. So, if you aren't familiar with Chintai, it is a token leasing platform where EOS token holders can lend their unused EOS to those applications that need the network resources. Chintai aggregates the tokens from the lenders and creates the marketplace between lender and app builder, paying out a dividend to the lenders in the process. It's a great system benefiting both parties involved. But as you can imagine, this type of system ends up with an account with a whole lot of tokens in it. The Chintai lease account currently holds over 2 million EOS in it, and this number is growing daily. This is worth about 8 million US dollars at the current token price. If this account was somehow compromised and the tokens in it lost, it would be devastating to all involved, including to the overall reputation of EOS, similar to how the DAO hack hurt Ethereum. So how do we structure something like this so that it has the highest possible level of security? Well, let's look at how EOS42 and the other BPs behind Chintai have set this up. What you see here is the current hierarchical structure that controls the Chintai lease account. This first layer underneath the main account is made up of the 11 block producers you just saw here on the Chintai website, all of whom are Chintai project sponsors. And these BPs altogether share in the account security. The threshold is set up so as to require six signatures out of the 11 block producers to approve any changes to this account. This way, if one or two BPs were to lose their keys or get their keys stolen, nothing bad would happen here. A hacker would have to somehow gain access to six of the BP accounts in order to gain access to the Chintai lease account. By setting it up this way, the token lenders don't need to put their trust in a single person or a single organization. Same thing with the 11 block producer sponsors. None of these BPs need to put their trust in, say, EOS42 or any other single organization for that matter. To do something shady with the Chintai lease account would require collusion among six of the 11 BPs, which seems highly unlikely to pull off without one of those BPs sounding the alarm. Now, you'll notice that there is another layer of accounts here in between the BPs and the public keys. This is EOS Nation. EOS Nation within their own BP account has repeated the pattern of requiring multiple signatures in order to perform actions on their account. Whenever the account authority is distributed out in this pattern, whether at the Chintai level up here or at the EOS Nation level down here, this is what they call a multi-sig account, which is short for multiple signature. Now, both of the multi-sigs in this example happen to be mapped to accounts, but you can also set up multi-sigs so as to map directly to keys as well. Or you could set it up as a combination of both keys and accounts. But remember that even when accounts are used in the multi-sig, the tree always ends in a public key, which is under the control of a human being in the real world holding the private key. All right, now during this first high-level overview, we cheated a little bit in how we described this. We didn't mention the word permission once, and it's actually EOSIO permissions that are at the heart of this whole structure. Permissions are what make this layered hierarchy possible. So let's talk about owner and active. Owner and active are standard default permissions built into every account. We, the EOS community, often refer to owner and active as keys. And this might have caused some confusion, making it sound like owner and active are keys when they are, in actuality, not keys, but permissions. The reason why we say owner keys and active keys is because keys happen to be the most common things that these permissions are mapped to. Going back to our Chintai lease account, this authority structure that we've been showing so far is the owner permission of the Chintai lease account. And when you link accounts together like the lines in our diagram imply, you're not actually linking one entire account to another entire account. What you're doing is linking one specific account permission to another specific account permission. So the owner permission of Chintai lease is mapped to the active permission of the 11 BPs. The only exception to this is EOS New York, which has set up a custom permission specifically for the Chintai lease use case. And if we look at EOS Nation again, we see that the main EOS Nation account's active permission here is mapped to their multi-sig account's active permission, which then distributes trust out to the active permissions of eight EOS Nation stakeholders. 
each of which are finally mapped to public keys. You can look up the permissions on any account using block explorers such as blocks.io. Here is the Chintai lease owner permission. And you can see the mapping to the active permissions of the 11 BPs, except for the custom permission that EOS New York uses here. Blocks.io uses this annotation to denote permissions mapping. Account name at permission name. And in terms of thresholds and weights, you can see the threshold of six, which we discussed earlier, and each BP has an equal weight of one in this particular example. So the math in this one is very straightforward. But if we drill down and look at the multi-sig under EOS Nation, we see more variance in the thresholds and the weights. Under EOS Nation, the owner permission has a threshold of five, and active has a threshold of three, and the weights are anywhere from one to three. Under active, this means some individuals alone have enough authority to reach that three threshold. But the root permission, the owner permission, requires two to five people, depending on their weight, in order to reach that five threshold. Now, in addition to accounts having a name, having tokens, and having permissions, some accounts also have code. Because as we all know, EOS is a smart contract platform. And so a common use case is for us to empower smart contracts to move tokens around on our behalf based on the logic defined in that contract. Chintai Lease is one of those accounts that holds code, the logic behind the Chintai token leasing platform. When it comes to code, just like how we human beings cannot perform actions on an account without reaching the threshold on one of those account permissions, smart contract code also has to abide by those same exact rules. Code cannot perform actions on an account, such as transferring tokens, without reaching certain permissions thresholds. This is where eosio.code comes into play. If we look at the active permission under Chintai lease, we see the 11 BPs just like how it is in the owner permission. But we also see this additional, very special line item at the top of the list here, Chintai lease at eosio.code. This line is what grants the code access to perform actions on behalf of this account. And being that the threshold is six, and the EOSIO code line here has a weight of six, this means that the code can perform actions on this account without any human intervention. Essentially, this means the Chintai lease tokens are under the control of the smart contract of this account. Only through the active permission, though. Humans alone, the 11 BPs, control the owner permission of Chintai lease. EOS DAC is taking some innovative approaches when it comes to their permissions management, and specifically how EOS DAC grants access to the code. So, let's continue this discussion of code permission, but move over to our second example. So first, what is EOS DAC? EOS DAC is a block producer, but there's something special about EOS DAC that sets them apart from the other BPs, in that EOS DAC is structured as a DAC, a decentralized autonomous community. So EOS DAC is not owned and operated by a private organization, but instead holds elections for what they call custodians. And it is the 12 elected custodians who run the EOS DAC block producer. Here is the EOS DAC account authority structure. Now, as we were just discussing, we want to get into how EOS DAC has set up their EOSIO.code permissions. But before we get into the code permissions, the first thing to note here is the cool way that EOS DAC has decoupled the permissions logic into a separate account. These three accounts up here are the ones that hold the code and the tokens. Then there's this DAC authority account down here. This account has no tokens and no code, but it does have some extensive permissions logic. With multi-sig set up for the 12 EOS DAC custodians, and with custom permissions created for high, medium, and low risk actions. What Michael Yates and the EOS DAC team have done here is they followed an important design pattern, the separation of concerns. This design allows the three accounts up here to have very simple permissions logic, where they don't need to replicate all of the custodian multi-sigs over and over again in each of these accounts. The custodian multi-sigs are set up once and only once under the DAC authority account down here. And then these three accounts can simply map their owner and active permissions 
to the active permission of DAC authority without recreating the wheel every time. So if we were to go into a block explorer and look in any of these three main EOS DAC accounts, we'll see owner and active mapped to DAC authority at active in each of them. EOS DAC tokens mapped to DAC authority at active. DAC custodian, again, owner and active are mapped to DAC authority at active. And EOS DAC the DAC, again, owner and active are mapped the same way. All right, now back to the topic of code permissions. EOS DAC is defining some best practices in terms of safely and securely connecting smart contract code with account permissions. Code that has a bug in it or a security vulnerability has the potential to cause major problems when that code is empowered to transfer tokens out of a given account. So EOS DAC has started configuring time delays alongside any code that is charged with moving tokens around. Now we haven't mentioned time delays yet in this video, but time delays are the third and final thing that permissions can be mapped to. Permissions can map to public keys, other permissions, or to time delays. These time delays are not the same thing as the three-day staking period. The three-day staking period is specific to the EOS token for voting and resource procurement. The time delays we're talking about here, in the context of permissions, work within the same weights and thresholds logic as our other two items. Let's look at how EOS DAC is using time delays to understand them better. These two accounts here are the two EOS DAC accounts that hold tokens, and the XFER, the transfer permission on these accounts, empower code to manage those tokens. This transfer permission is configured the exact same way on both of these accounts. And as you can see here, transfer has a threshold of two. And this threshold can be met in a few ways. First, the DAC authority medium permission has a weight of two. So if the custodians reach the medium threshold under the DAC authority account, which requires nine custodian approvals, the transfer permission has reached its threshold and the, tra and the transaction executes without delay. Otherwise, these two here would together have to reach the two threshold. This means that the code can initiate a transfer, but in order to reach the two threshold, the code has to wait for 60 minutes before the transaction is allowed to execute. The idea behind this delay is that it gives EOS DAC a bit of a safeguard in case the code starts acting wonky due to a bug or if there's a security vulnerability in the code that's being exploited. Now, you might be saying, is 60 minutes really enough time for us slow humans to notice something bad is happening and react to it? What if it happens while we're all sleeping? This is where automated external validators come into play. As Michael Yates described in his Preventing the DAO post, automated scripts can be created which run off-chain. And these off-chain scripts can monitor EOS accounts for misbehaving code, and assuming the time delay was implemented, the robots can catch the misbehavior and cancel the transaction before it is allowed to execute. So the time delay doesn't need to be long enough for us slow humans to react. It just needs to be long enough for the external automated validators to react. The 60 minutes that EOS DAC is currently using is plenty of time for the validators to react. In fact, Michael Yates is working on systems that would shorten the time delay to only a few seconds. This is the direction EOS is headed. With intelligent structures like Chintai and like EOS DAC being implemented across the ecosystem of accounts, intertwining with each other into complex clusters of accounts. This more mature version of EOS will strengthen our bridges across the dividing line here and turn lost and stolen keys into minor inconveniences. Now, the two structures that we covered in this episode were designed by highly technical block producers, and we're not expecting the typical end user to go in and configure this stuff themselves. If you don't know what you're doing, please be careful and seek help before messing with your permissions. A mistake to your permissions could get you locked out of your account, which obviously defeats the purpose. But throughout this year, you're going to see more and more utilities being released that will guide the end user through this process in a simple, user-friendly way. Chestnut is an early example of this, but more are coming. That's it for this week's episode. Thanks for watching. If you learned something from this video, please share it with other EOS community members who might not be fully aware of the powerful capabilities of EOSIO permissions. Because the better our community understands how this stuff works, the stronger our blockchain will ultimately become. Thanks, and we'll see you next week, right here 
on EOS Weekly.